it's great to have tonight Melika um and she she lives in Yorkshire she lives in the lovely lovely uh, village of Pateley Bridge which has got the the country's oldest sweet shop now how I know that I really ought not to be telling you but Melika it's great Melika rather it's great to have you um I think first of all let me find out about your family you come from a large family yourself how many brothers sisters do you have yeah I've got six brothers and I'm the youngest so and no sisters no sisters <laughs> and how many children do you have i've got four children yeah and um so are they boys girls the eldest is a boy and then i had three girls right so it's the other way around wonderful well we, we there's a lot to explore about uh, about yourself but you don't originally come from um, from yorkshire you're a you're a londoner is that right i am a londoner yes actually the more we listen to you i think it's very apparent you're a londoner but um tell us a bit about your family what, what was it like tell us about your mother your father your home yeah so my mom had me later in life and um, she had me at 44 um and yeah i guess i came out of her fourth marriage to mm. um a turkish man <laughs> Um, sadly, um, their marriage didn't last. So um, I grew up in a single parent home with my mum. Uh, she raised me. Um, and then most of my childhood probably uh, was just me and my mum, um, because my brothers obviously were a bit more older than I was. So they would have moved out of the home. Um, it was quite a quite an impoverished home, obviously a single parent. And um, there were things in the home which which for a child you know was a bit hard to uh, cope with at times so mm. there was um we had alcoholism uh in the home and um there was also um prostitution as well which i was um exposed to um right. yeah so it was quite a quite a quite a crazy upbringing mm. um but thankfully, my mum verbally always told, told me that she loved me and um, I always felt like she was doing doing well for me. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> were, were your brothers at, around at all? Because they would have seen what you'd seen. Uh, yeah. Were they around at all to help you through it? Um, they were a bit. One, Yeah, I mean, I don't need to go into their stories, but what I will say is I remember... Um, quite distinctively um maybe i was about seven um my brother moved out of home and he was the closest thing to like a dad that i ever really had wow. he was mm. very level-headed and sensible and loving mm. um and yeah he moved down to dorset where my family my mum's originally from because mm. he met a he met a lady there and he just was so upset telling me that he had to go um, and he felt awful about it because i was being left you know to to cope with the um you know the, the alcoholic parent um at, at that time you know thank god she's she you know combated that for herself but um yeah so no um yeah most of the brothers had sort of gone okay. by the time that i was seven they'd they'd probably yeah they'd moved mm. out by then and um, what about your father um so he he left your mum but did you see him yeah well mum actually kicked him out <laughs> <'cause> oh, <right. laughs> yeah um he didn't have a choice over that one um because it got it got violent and she didn't want to tolerate that. So yeah, but he he loved me and wanted to um, wanted to see me. But um, the uh, so I did see him up until like the age of seven. Um, I would see him on a weekly basis, um, and his mm. family, who are absolutely lovely people. Um, but I think for a child stepping into a whole new culture, um, that one day a week was a bit it was another thing that was just too too much for me to cope with so i yeah i said that i didn't want to do that anymore so i didn't see my dad from around the age of seven until 19. so oh, that was wow. a good reunion when it happened <laughs> uh, now Malika, presumably if he was turkish he came from a, an islamic background what about your mother yeah so that's right my family do come from an islamic background my mum comes from a catholic background she was uh 
schooled by nuns. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, she put me into the, the, Catholic, the Catholic schools and um, she would take me to church when I was little to, you know, get my place in the schools, how it worked mm. back then. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that's my background. And, and so did you go to church or did you go to the mosque or, or what? No, so I didn't go to the mosque. Um, I only visited once as a child with my family. Um, I just used to go to the Catholic Church, which I thought was um, the the flagship of Christianity. I didn't actually know mm -hmm. anything about evangelicals, really. I thought that they were a cult. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just thought that me going to church was probably the most normal thing about my life. Um, apart from going to school um, so yeah that's what we did I, I did stop going to church though once I got into secondary school um, mm. my mum didn't take me anymore um, but at the age of 13 I did have this longing to go back and so I used to go with my best friend because she used to go with her her mum her family so mm. I sort of jumped back into the church then now, you obviously saw things at home, which, you know, children shouldn't be seeing. Yeah. Um, were you abused at all? No, I wasn't abused until this day. I honestly have moments where I cannot but praise God that nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So my mum, bless her, you know, she, she wasn't a Christian, you know, not so I can't hold her to a higher standard, you know, but um she really wanted to bless me as a child and she did that through giving me horses <laughs> oh right and um that what uh, so uh, the reason why i'm saying that is just to give an example of how mm. abuse could have taken place in my childhood so she would just leave me alone with this man who she didn't know <laughs> Um, with his horses mm -hmm. and he was such a lovely man till this day I just wish I could contact him and thank him for everything he did for me as a child because um, he was a steady figure in my life mm -hmm. a male figure that you know I really appreciated and he was so generous and so kind he really gave me a lot of attention which I didn't get as a child you know eye contact and mm -hmm. conversations and how I use and so but my mum never really thought you know, is this a safe thing to do? She's she's miles and miles away in a field with a man she doesn't know. And mm -hmm. it wasn't strange to me as a child, but um, I remember something really traumatic happening as a young teenager. I can't tell you how old I was, maybe 12, but my mum stormed into the room and she was freaking out saying, what's he done to you? What has he done to you? And I just mm -hmm. remember feeling so terrified at what she was insinuating like what mm. you know and just this so I guess it was then this whole vulnerability came over me and I think it probably dawned I don't know why it was a trigger point all those years later for my mum to think oh something could have happened mm. I don't know why she thought that because nothing did happen but mm. all to say there was that wasn't the only situation in my life where I wasn't safeguarded there was countless times um in the presence of um unsavory characters or random strangers as a mm. child that so but through all of it there was no abuse that One took place so. so what were you like as a teenager then yeah so as a teenager um bless my mum i wasn't the most respectful daughter to be honest with you um i was never taught respect which is not an excuse but i was actually quite um quite of the the alpha character i had to develop um i guess my own level of safety i think some people say that you know not to give an excuse to the aggression and the anger that i i had as a teenager but i i was i was quite aggressive um quite a, quite an irritated easily to be irritated mm -hmm. person and um yeah i guess being on the streets a lot you know um as a teenager hanging out with friends at all hours and meeting up with random boys part of different gangs um i guess it just this this aggression and this this confidence i guess for me it was a useful thing to have because the streets mm -hmm. weren't where i grew up they weren't really a safe friendly place so for me i felt grateful that 
my home had taught me how to be this um hard person and that i already felt like i've experienced so much from home and having older brothers who had already you know gotten into trouble with the law or um you know whatever it had been i'd already felt like well there's nothing you guys can do to me that's going to intimidate me so um yeah i was quite a bold quite a bold stupid <laughs> really. well, that's a very honest appraisal of yourself yeah. okay now w were you aware of of god of the lord during your teenage years did you ever pray did you go to you said when you were a young teenager you went to church but in older years did you yeah so um i would say that i definitely thought i knew god um mm. i but i was very godless so it jesus was a tick box exercise um as in going to church on a sunday and so for example roger i i've even been to mass drunk before that, that oh, wow. that's how that's how much how stupid my life was you know how god how godless it was and yet how i appeased this need of god by just going to mass every sunday mm. um yeah so i didn't you know for me i just i knew that god existed i knew that it would be ridiculous for everything to just come out of nowhere i remember thinking atheists were were just silly and you know but at the same time i had no knowledge of jesus so even though i'd gone to mass at hundreds of times you know thousands of times in my life <laughs> with what felt like it um i didn't actually even know that jesus uh, wanted to die or, or was it was prophesied at least mm. and he knew mm. that he was going to die so that was like the full extent of just my my you know <laughs> My lack of knowledge i just thought that the romans captured him and um you know put him on the cross and oh no and you know so there, there was no knowledge of god so there was no power of god in my life there was no mm. repentance there was no um grieving over my sin i embraced my sin and i never felt bad about it i completely lived under the ignorance of sin um mm. just such folly such mm. folly to think that i could have had both things so mm. now eventually you went to university that must big moment where did you go so i went to um a university in southampton but it's southampton solent you know oh, right <laughs> no that's great i went to southampton as well so uh, yeah. great city and and what were you studying so i wanted to be a psychotherapist so i studied psychology with counseling okay um, did you enjoy that i really did i did really well as well oh. Very good. Yeah, I, th there the similarity between you and me at Southampton parts. Yeah. <laughs> you did very well. We won't go down that line. Okay, yeah. and it was at Southampton, wasn't it, that eventually you became a Christian? So tell us what led up to that. So I came home to visit in the first year of university. Um, I think it might have been around Easter time, mm. and um, I had a friend who was part of a gang at that time. And so I was really surprised when he told me that he wouldn't come to church with me. So I think I might have been quite quite prideful in saying, oh, I'm going to church on Sunday. Do you want to mm. come with me? And I was really shocked when he said I would never step foot in your church. And I, I'd never in my 19 years of life, I had never heard anything negative about the Catholic Church. It was literally the first time ever that anyone has said anything remotely off about it so i was really 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 perplexed and obviously as i was saying i was an angry person anyway so it it caused a lot of um <laughs> yeah it, it caused a lot of sparks to fly mm. um and so from that point onwards in mine and this friend's relationship we just always spoke about christianity because i couldn't believe that he wouldn't come to my church um and it just yeah it just didn't make sense to me so we just kept speaking 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 and over the course of months i think maybe about five months um that's when i gave my life to christ and it was so we'd always end up in arguments always mm. arguing but he was really persistent and he he didn't care he was really thick-skinned and he didn't sugarcoat the gospel to me he told it as it was and he let the offense sort of just rest right and, um i remember two questions that he asked me 
that really and truly started to get the ball rolling regarding the spirit moving in my life. And he said to me, you say you love God, but you don't even know who he is. Like you say, you know him. And because I, I was adamant, I kept telling my friend, but I do know God. Like, mm. how can you keep saying, you know, I don't know him. And he said to me, if you don't read the Bible, if you don't come to like, cause God's trying to tell you who he is for his word. Mm. And if you don't read it, how do you know who he is? And he said that, you know, when millions of people die, they all have an image of who they're going to come in come before he was like but there's not millions of gods there's one so Mm. you need to Mm. get out of your own man-made god and face the one that you're gonna face before it's too too late so that really stuck with me because it made it made logical sense and Mm. you know logic is something which you know we should all strive for so Mm. it just made sense and then he also asked me, you say you love God, but you keep doing the things that he hates because he knew my lifestyle. He knew it was just silly. And so um, for me, that really struck a chord as well, because, again, it, it was just it was logical. If I said I loved him, why would I want to keep doing things that really displeased him, you know? Like my friend was saying to me, you wouldn't do that to your, you know, a family member. You wouldn't keep spitting in their face, but you're doing it to God. Um, and so those two questions, I just kept wrestling with them and I, I couldn't I couldn't escape them. And then one night he um, <laughs> he asked me if I would listen to a sermon. Hmm. But I didn't know what a sermon was. And so he was explaining to me that, I'm, you know, it's this man he's going to be talking and about Jesus will you listen to it it's on YouTube so I said okay fine Mm -hmm. and then I I put it on he sent me a sermon by Paul Warsha Mm -hmm. and it wasn't just like a short you know 30 minute talk it was literally like two hours (laughs) (laughs) why he gave that to me for the first sermon I don't know and it was Mm -hmm. called the tenant ten indictments I think against the church and so When I put it on and I saw this man standing there in a suit, I literally, I turned it off straight away and I said, this is a businessman trying to sell me something, you know, because I was really used to the priests in their gowns, which made, you know, I I thought it made them seem, you know, more holy, more humble in these, in these gowns. And so to see this man wearing a suit, I just, it was so, it just wasn't authentic to me. And he was begging me, he's like, please just listen to it, listen to it. And so as it started to play and he was speaking about people who claim to love God, but also their sin and how incompatible it is, I just started to get really angry, like probably the most (laughs) anger I've ever felt in my life. It was just like coming to the boiling point now. Mm. And um, I remember being so angry that I was crying. Like I could throttle the man for, for, <laughs> for basically bursting my bubble or trying to say that I couldn't have God and live the way that I was living. And um, there was no vulnerability about the tears. It was literally just anger and just I was infuriated with this mm. man. And then um, as he continued to speak, I realized that actually the sins that I had, I was actually enslaved to them. So they weren't just like a choice. I wasn't just choosing them, um, choosing my lifestyle. I was actually in bondage to them. And that even if I wanted to Mm. just have God, as he was putting it, I couldn't even do it. And there's something in me, the anger started to go away. And what was replaced was just a desperate, desperate sense of need and so much fear and terror um you know because it it started to the holy spirit was starting to open my eyes that i needed jesus and it just almost felt as though he was on the other side of the room and i was in shackles and i couldn't get to him Hmm. and i started to just weep and cry out and um i stopped the sermon (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> at that point <laughs> at that point I stopped the sermon you know I'm crying out to the Lord to deliver me and as that great hymn says you know my chains fell off mm. that's what happened that night so mm. I just 
felt as though my chains had been released and the comfort blanket of my sin that I had been hiding behind was just stripped away and I was free to approach Jesus mm. and to repent of my sins. Um, so, yeah, that's how it happened. And had you, did you understand then that, that, yes, to repent of your sins, but the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he'd carried your sins, he'd paid for you. Did you understand that? I did. I, I mm. did understand that. I think where my friend had been trying to talk to me about the gospel for those months, it hadn't, it hadn't hit me mm. because I already felt like I had a relationship. So when I, when the reality came to me that actually you don't have a relationship with God, mm. um, that's when the terror came in. And because I do, I'd realized I was choosing my sin and I had been using it as, as, you know, as a comfort to just, indulge myself and mm. you know um not only that but there was a lot of other issues as well so that you know just the longing for attention which i which i had obviously felt like i hadn't received mm. i was getting through you know dressing provocatively um you know trying to so i knew that a number of my sins were there because i was trying to better my life mm. but actually when jesus came he gave me everything that i needed you know mm. i didn't need to i didn't need to be selfish anymore to get what i wanted i didn't need to strive for money anymore you know coming from a impoverished home i felt like mm. i need to i need to do this i need to live a certain way in order to survive you know i need because my whole life's been about survival <laughs> and i didn't just want to survive like my mum. i wanted to excel i wanted to live mm. the life that the world said was amazing you know, I wanted to have my own home, my, you know, whatever car I wanted. And so anyway, coming to Christ, it was just letting go of all of that. And it was embracing, it's like finding that pearl, that treasure, that, that was it. And was this an um, immediate transformation? Did, you know, was it one day you were like this, the next day being completely changed? It was, it really, really was. There, there was a, there was a balance of it. So I'd explain. So the next day i tried to for example put in my rap music i used to love to listen to someone called little wayne and so <laughs> i remember putting it in on my walk to uni and the moment i put it in my ears i just felt repulsed and not mm. only that just things like femininity which i'd never had before i didn't have a love of i know it's silly but i didn't have a love of flowers i didn't have a love for all things gentle and all things lovely i was my, I was hard. And so overnight there was just this easing. There was just this embracing of all things beautiful. It was like in those Disney films when the birds come out singing, <laughs> the princess is there and she's, you know, and not only that, but obviously the desire for Christ and his word was immense right away. And I think um, through that, you know, I had, I had my friends in the world who, well, literally one, one girl in particular, she was mourning, she was weeping one day and she was saying, Melika, it's like you've died, you've, where, you've gone. And I, and I said to her with a big smile on my face, it was awful because she's crying. I was like, I have gone, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I have, you know, obviously in the midst of that, sharing the gospel and trying to share hope mm -hmm. and comfort mm -hmm. in her in that. But there was a very real sense that the old Melika had died. Um, but when I say there was an element still there, and that was due to, so I remember going to Bible study. Yes, tell us how you were invited to that. Yes, yeah, so basically there was a girl in my class um, at university in the first year who was asked by my husband now, who I didn't know at the time, yes. who asked her, is there anyone in your class that you can invite to Bible study who, who's a Christian and who would appreciate that? And she said, no, there's no Christians in my class, but there is a Catholic girl. And then my husband said, oh, no, forget about that. And then <laughs> he's like, she's not going to want to come, you know. And um, and so anyway, but she she had the heart to want to um, bring me to the Bible study. Um, and I'm sure my husband would have obviously wanted me to go as well. Yes. He, he was just thinking about Christians who really yes. love Jesus. So she had had it in her heart for over a year to, to, to bring me to this study. And mm. she was just really intimidated and quite, quite scared to sort of approach me on that. Just, I think, because of the person that I was mm. quite loud and aggressive. And, um, the, the week that I came to Christ, so I think it was literally a couple of days later, she finally, the Lord finally gave her that extra push 
um, to ask me to come to Bible study. And so when she asked me, she I think she was almost bracing herself for the backlash of how dare you, you know, ask me <laughs> um, to come to your Bible study. But she was greeted with, yes, I would love to come. And so... <laughs> That was just the Lord's grace in her life and that kindness just to allow her to approach me just as I'd got saved. <laughs> so you started going to Bible study? Yeah, so I started to go to Bible study. And as I was saying before, um, I was, I was, so I had a huge lack of knowledge with the scriptures because I'd mm. never read them before. Mm. Um, and so I didn't know, for example, I know this is ridiculous, but I didn't know that swearing was a sin. So I um I went to Bible study and one of the brave girls, godly girls, heard me and she said to me after the, the study, you, you do know that the Lord, you know, we should let him purify us, you know, cleanse our tongues. And I was so embarrassed because at oh. this point I wanted to be a soldier for Christ. I wanted to, you know, hold up the banner of all things good and represent him. So when she called me out in with so much grace, I was horrified. And so it was just a matter of time really just to consume my word and find out you know what was fitting for a believer what wasn't fitting for a believer so mm. in a sense yes it was very much a change overnight coming to christ but there was so much that i i had to learn but mm. i thank god for his word yeah and you met your husband to be then and yeah. um married and you left london and you came up to yorkshire but these are all very good moves yeah and uh, but um now you said you've got how many children? Yeah, so I've got I've got four children, but I've had I've got five children. So well, one so, of them with the Lord. Yeah, one of them. Okay, so I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask one or two questions. Just tell us how old are your living children? Yes, yeah, so my eldest is eight, and that's my son. And then I have a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and at this point, a six-week-old. Right. So wow. Girls, yeah. Well, congrats. All uh, yes. Uh, so th um, three girls and one boy. Yeah. And but then you you've had one that, that that you say is with the Lord has gone to heaven. Now, what number was this one? That was child three. three. Child three. Okay. And she was a little girl. Yes, she, she was, was a girl. A little girl. She was beautiful. She was so bonny. She was called oh. Kezia. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Lovely name. Now, so what, what was she born a sickly child? What happened? No, I had a beautiful home birth with her and um, my husband actually um delivered her oh wow <laughs> right <laughs> midwife didn't arrive on time but she was so healthy she was of good weight and she was you know building building up her weight every week it was so exciting to watch her development um and then it was honestly just tragedy um struck one night and it was a really really typical case of sudden infant death at six weeks um where she so this is what we'd call a cot death is it yes that's right yeah. yeah so um i was really tired um one night and my and i re remember holding my sweet girl and my husband because he's just so lovely says to me why don't you go and get a head start you know why don't you go and get a head start and get some sleep mm. um because it was, it was the early days right when mums don't mm. sleep <laughs> <laughs> um so I just remember saying to my husband over and over again, it was so strange. I know it was the Lord's hand over everything, but I was just saying to him, I don't want to let her go. Like, I really don't want to let her go. And um, I did because I'm a good wife and I listened. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, my husband woke me up um, from my sleep a few hours later. Um, bless him. He, you know, he didn't, he's, so you've got those who fight and those who fly. I'm the fly and he's the fight. So in the midst of tragedy, he's amazing. He's calm. And so he wakes me up very, <clears throat> you know, very gently, but very, you know, firm. You need to call the ambulance. She's not breathing. And so it was horrible. It really, 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 really was awful. And as I just said, I'm the flight. So even with Christ, I still fly. <laughs> so in, in the midst of a moment of you know so i just remember my mother-in-law she lived up the road from us and i remember it raining i had nothing on my feet um i ran to her house after i called the ambulance i'm knocking on her door you know saying quick calm you know because is not breathing and um so yeah it was just my husband trying to um you know give cpr um but 
yeah, and the ambulance coming, and they did they did manage to get back a heartbeat, mm. but um, and we went we went on to the second hospital through the night into um, a hospital up London, um, and we had you know our dear pastors come to be with us and um, one of their wives, which was just so amazing, but. We were given, we were, we were told eventually, basically, um, that she, her heart had stopped for too long and her organs mm. had started to shut down. So there was too much um, of a certain substance in her body that they couldn't remove it now. Um, and so they said they'd have to take her off the life support machine. Um, and so that was really, really, really hard. Mm. I remember... We would be, all of us, I mean, I say all of us, my pastors and my husband, we would be weeping and then the next minute we'd be praying and then we'd be praising, we'd be singing and then we'd be laughing and then we'd be weeping. Um, mm. It was really bad. And then so when they took her off the life support machine, um, the woman said to me, it will probably be about 20 minutes for her to, for her heart to stop. And um, yeah, it actually turned, it, it, it got over an hour. It was, it, it, it went on for ages. And I remember the nurse saying to me, which I really wish she hadn't have said, because it was so painful. She said to me, this is really unusual. Your baby's got a really strong heart, you know. Oh, wow. And I just remember thinking, then why is this happening? Like, mm. I don't understand, you know, looking at her, this beautiful, beautiful, bonny, happy baby um, with this strong heart, you know, I was just mm. thinking, what, what, you know, I just, I just remember thinking this is in, I just remember thinking it was a dream and it was insane. So, um, but what I will say is her death was such a, it, it, the Lord used it to gift us in a sense of, um, I think a boldness to face death. So prior to that, I'd always been quite fearful of being confronted with death, especially the death of a child. I'd, 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 I'd occasionally mm. ponder on it, or oh, what would it be like? Oh, it'd be horrible, the worst thing, you know. And with that flight mentality, I always thought I'd never be able to behold a child, a child without life, you know, like in their nostrils. And um I just remember um, embracing her once she had passed and washing her and dressing her and thinking death truly has lost its sting. I just remember just this, just, I just remember feeling as though I'd been promoted in rank as a soldier for Christ and that I truly was ready on the battlefield to face all manner of things because quite frankly, I had already overcome the worst of it now on this side of earth. I mean, that's how I felt. So it was such a gift. It, it really mm. was a gift. So you and never blamed God or felt angry with God? No. And that's that's something which hasn't made sense even to a lot of Christians and to myself as well. Um, I don't know why I never said to the Lord why. It's truly, it's, yeah, I, I don't know why. I guess it's just the resting in his sovereignty and his love and his, his wisdom that all all his ways are good it was painful it was really painful you know i was breastfeeding at the time so even physiologically it was just all you know my hormones as well and it's like that typical i know i don't remember like back in the day when i used to watch extenders as a child you know it was that it, it was that typical thing where that crazy mum, you know, should really steal another person's baby right now because it feels so oh. unnatural that she's lost her child. You know, so physiologically, my body was just like, what is going on? But I just remember having so much peace about it, but a lot of pain and obviously a huge amount of grieving to do. But yeah, there was no, why is this happening? So mm. I don't know why. I think I've actually pondered on that this year um as i've grown more into adulthood you know why why wasn't there more wise and it might be the fact that i'd already embraced a lot as a child i mean or mm. lived through a lot as a child that in some ways the lord had made me and allowed me to experience things that i don't know maybe would play a part in trusting him to different degrees you know now as an adult i don't know but mm. now malika um are you confident that you'll meet Kezia one day do you believe she's in heaven yes I do so prior to losing her funny enough I didn't actually have a set 
a theological understanding about that. I was I was all over the place. Sometimes I believe that infants that passed um, didn't go to be with the Lord. Um, but when it struck me, um, my pastors came alongside me um, and they gave me not only their wise counsel from the word, but they gave me some good uh, literature to read as well. And not only that, but just with the presence of the spirit and um, in prayer, I just felt as though, yeah, my daughter is with Jesus, not even because she has a confession, but because of his grace and she's undeserving, you know, and absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, now you said, if I can go back, you said that um, you stopped seeing your father when you were seven years of age, mm-hmm. did becoming a Christian or what at the age of 19, did that change your attitude to your father at all? It did. I just wanted to tell him about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get in touch with him? You know. You love him. Okay. And and how did you get in touch with him? You knew where he was? Yeah. So I was told by him, I don't know if it's the real reason, but he said that he'd left England when he found out I didn't want to see him or wasn't allowed to see him because there was nothing left for him here. So he went back to live in Turkey for all those years. And then mm. He came back, um, yeah, around when I was 19. It was my lovely cousin who who said to me, your, your dad's back. And we both came up with this plan to just go and surprise him. And um, <laughs> when, I, when he opened the door. Oh, right. And, so that's what you did. Yeah, okay. that's what I did. I still had a lot of, um, yeah, craziness left in me. <laughs> so, um he was white as a ghost. Yeah, he couldn't believe the fact that I'd sought him out. And he looked like he'd just seen a dead, per- not a dead person, but he was, he lost all the colour in his face. And, oh, wow. You know, it was a, it was a great reunion. He, he knew immediately who you were. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And and what, were you able to embrace? Yeah, we embraced. Um, they, you know, I'd been told certain stories growing up about why, um, I would have every reason not to want to seek him out. Um, But at this point of knowing Christ, all the things that have been said against him, I just wanted to love him really and embrace him and get the opportunity to tell him about Jesus. So, And what was his reaction to that? uh, Yeah, sadly, it was just um, so (laughs) he was really disappointed that I was really passionate about my faith. He wanted me to focus on more intellectual things. He said that I was wasting my brain and bringing shame to him um, and dishonor. So, (laughs) yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't the the fairy tale sort of. uh, Are you still in touch with him? I am. It's 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 a relationship that is quite strange just because of his beliefs. He's um, so he is from a Muslim background, but um, he's also into yoga. Mm. So um, he's actually a yoga master previously. I don't know whether he still they can still hold that position into their lives, but he attained a high level of yoga. And so it actually affected um, his worldview. So he didn't Mm. just do it for exercise, but um he got to the point where he would tell me that he can't lie anymore and it was becoming quite difficult to mm. engage with him because he would he would tell me lies about um things and then <laughs> even though they were like be documented on my phone there would be this outright mm. ignorant sort of uh, but I don't lie and so it was quite strained and then you know I you know, even just going on to have more children, you know, I, I mm. felt as though it was just a silly thing yeah. to do in his opinion. And so, but I still love him and we've got each other's numbers. It's just, it's mm. strained every now and then. And what about your mother? What was her reaction when you became a Christian? Yeah. So to this point, it's the most tragic thing, um, unless Christ turns it around, because when I came to faith, I obviously shared with her because I, mm. I love loved her more than anything in the world you know at that point when I was 19 you know and um I just wanted her to come to the Lord and she she listened to the gospel and she seemingly um was responding to it I got her a bible and she was reading it 
And one day I went into her room and I heard her listening to a Bible teacher called John MacArthur, who mm. I uh, listened to a lot when I got saved. And I remember saying to her, mom, who's on your radio? Like I knew who it was, but I was just, I couldn't believe it. And she said, oh, I don't really know, but he's teaching the Bible. I said, mom, you're listening to John MacArthur. Like he's, he's a good Bible teacher. However, um, it would literally be like a week or two weeks later, she did a complete 180 flip and she got quite, um, quite verbally um, insulting against the evangelical church and was saying how we are um, a money hungry um, group of people. Um, and basically what you might see on some of the tele evangelists yeah. you know, in America, yeah. that sort of thing. She was branding us all as that, and she said that nuns who schooled her said that one day someone would, some people would try to take her away from the true faith. Um, and she was like, "So I'm prepared, and I'm I'm going to stand my ground, and I'm never going to leave the Catholic Church." And then at that point, she started going to the church. Um, so at, so if you remember, she wouldn't take me to church as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I went on my own. But when I got saved and witnessed to her, she started to go back to the Catholic Church and she did mm. more than ever before. So she joined the choir. Mm. She would go midweek. It was like this, this zeal um, mm. for an appearance of godliness, you know, an appearance mm. of it. Um, so, yeah, till, till this point today, um, there's there's no um, longing for the truth mm. in the word. Uh, yeah. So it's. Mm. Uh, it's great to chat with you and lovely to see your enthusiasm time's gone but uh, yeah. why are you so passionate so enthusiastic about the lord jesus mm. <laughs> because i i know that i was rescued i know that if he had not stepped in even even in my childhood i believe he was walking beside me mm. as he does with with those he will save I would I don't know where I would be and I know that my sin would definitely take me down you know to death and um I was rescued and I you know I'm passionate about Jesus and sharing him because people shared the truth of me even when seemingly I didn't want to hear it and was quite aggressive to the truth um to have someone who was persistent I thank God that he didn't sugarcoat the truth and he just told it for what it was and the Holy Spirit did his work. And um, so what more can I do now than be kind to other people and tell them about Jesus, you know, the father who, who is love. Well, yeah, the father who is lovely, you know, who sent mm. the son to do what we can never do and to, you know, leave his spirit with us. It's, mm. It's something that needs to be told. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're very, very glad that you told it. Thanks so much for sharing so honestly. Uh, and, and God bless you and your husband and your children. And uh, what a privilege to be living in Yorkshire, eh? Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, America, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, sharing your, your life. That, that, there's so many different facets to, to your life that was, was so was so helpful but before we do that we're going to to hear a bit of that wonderful gospel preached by tom tom thank you so much for being here we look forward to hearing what you're going to bring us now thank you great well it's um a pleasure to be with you all tonight um as steve's just said uh, we're going to think just a little bit more about the good news of jesus the good news of the bible now just to to calm your nerves it's not going to be a two hour long sermon like that one that Melika was sent. We're just going to spend the next 10 minutes or so considering some of the things that's already been touched on and looking a bit more at some of those words that were read to us from, from the Bible earlier. And actually, I, I want to pick up on, on one thing uh, that Melika actually shared when she was sharing her, her testimony, how, how God has transformed her life. And she said, she said that after the, she'd become a Christian, after her life had been transformed, uh, which you can't deny, can you? I mean, it's so clear. Melika, you're a great storyteller um, at, at just sharing how Jesus has changed your life. I can picture it so clearly, the vast difference. Um, I can almost, if I'm honest, I can almost picture um, the old Melika. 
I can imagine myself being quite scared of the old Melika. Um, but wow, you've just been changed so clearly by Jesus. But you said after you'd become a Christian, after that you'd had your life transformed, some of your friends, um, they, they, were, they were mourning and weeping. And they said, Melika, is like you've died. And I thought, you know what? That's a really interesting thing. You, you said, I, I have, I have died, I have gone. And I thought that really speaks of something that is at the heart of the Christian message. It is at the heart of the good news about Jesus, because you see, the good news about Jesus is all about life. It's all about new life. It's about a new life, knowing the God who made you. It's about a transformed life, how Jesus just changes you from the inside out. It's about an everlasting life, a life for the, that we can be sure of forever in heaven uh, with, that, with the God who made us. But Melika's touched on this. You can't have that life in order to receive that life, that everlasting life. You can't have it without death. Death is key, a key message at the, at the heart of that gospel. And there's two deaths in particular that I, that I want to just talk about for the next um, few minutes. I want to talk about our death, that idea of dying to ourself. Melika said it, didn't she? She said that her old self had died. And I want to talk about the death of Jesus. So we're going to look at uh, those verses that were read to us from, uh, from the book of 1 Peter in the Bible. Um, and the first thing that I, I want to say is that I really think that you need to die to yourself, or as it's put in these verses in verse 24, that we might die to sins. Now, hold on a minute. Don't switch off. I know what you're thinking. This guy is bonkers. He is nuts that he's going to start this message that he thinks that I, that I really need to hear by saying that I need to die to myself. It sounds like the most backwards sounding message of good news ever. Uh, you're probably tempted to switch off, but I really urge you to hear me out first. Um, now, in order to understand what I mean to die to ourself, we need to understand what is the life that we need to die to. What am I saying here? The, the life that we need to die to. What, what does it mean to die to our sins? Well, it touches on that a little bit in, in what we read. Um, verse 25, let me read this again for you. It says, for you were like sheep going astray. Now, if you had to um, compare your life to an animal, I wonder what animal you would say you were like. Uh, maybe some of you would say I'm like um, a lion as bold as a lion or a, a tiger. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe if you're more honest, you'd say um, your life is like a sloth. You like to take things nice and slow. You like to be well rested and sleep a lot. What I'm pretty confident of is that none of you would say my life is like a sheep. And the reason why we wouldn't say that is because as much as, uh, as we might love sheep, um, especially for those of us in Yorkshire, we see sheep all over the dales. Um, as much as we might love them, though, you ask any farmer and you'll know sheep are stupid animals. <laughs> they're, they're not an animal to strive to be like. Um, they get themselves into all kinds of trouble. But this is what the Bible says we are like. The life of someone who doesn't know God who doesn't really have that relationship with God. They're like sheep that have gone astray. Let me tell you a few facts about sheep. Firstly, sheep, they just follow the crowd. I mean, we have that saying, don't we? Oh, you're just a sheep. You're just doing what everyone else is doing. Um, and it's true. You know, sheep will just do what every other sheep does. It'll look at another sheep, and if it sees it doing something, it will do it. Let me tell you how extreme this is. In, uh, in Turkey, a number of years ago, there was a, a Turkish farmer who said him and his shepherds, they had a flock of about 1,500 sheep. So one and a half thousand sheep, that's a lot of sheep. And they, they took these sheep um, to graze on some pasture, some grassland on some hills. Um, and they got them there and they thought, okay, they're, they're happy here, we'll go and have breakfast. So the, the farmer and the shepherds, they went to go and have some breakfast, have a bit of a break. And they're eating their breakfast and they're looking over the hills where they've left the sheep. And in the distance, they see a sheep start walking dangerously close to the edge of what was a cliff, a big drop. 
And they're thinking, oh boy, these sheep again, silly, stupid sheep, what are they going to do? Until they see this sheep walk closer and closer until bam, the sheep has jumped off this cliff. And they're thinking, great, these sheep. But the problem was all the other sheep had seen that sheep jump off the cliff and another sheep that saw it jump off. So it starts to walk close and then jumps off the cliff. And then the sheep see that one do it. So they all start to, until eventually, this is no word of a lie, all 1,500 sheep jumped off the cliff. Why? Because everyone else was doing it. That's what sheep are like. Thankfully, not, not all the sheep died. Uh, only 450 of the sheep died. Uh, the other ones managed to survive because um, their fall was cushioned by the mountain of wool, the mountain of sheep that they fell onto. But sheep do that. They, they, they just follow the crowd. They, they, they do what everyone else does. You know, the other thing about sheep is, is that they can be quite stubborn animals. And as the verse says, they go their own way. They go astray. They get lost. They get into all sorts of trouble and bother. They fall down ditches. You know, even if a sheep falls over onto its back, if a sheep falls onto its back, it will lie on its back until someone comes and rescues it. it. It can't physically flip over. So if no one comes to save it, it is helpless on its back. It will die. It, it will just starve to death. And that's what sheep are like. They go astray. They need a shepherd to look after it. And this is what the Bible is saying. The life without God, the life that you need to die to, that's what you're like. You're like a sheep that's gone astray. We do, if we're honest, we know it. We do just follow the crowd, don't we? We live our lives how everyone else lives them. Um, and, and stuff that we know actually is wrong. We'll do it because we say, well, look, that's what everyone else is doing. If we're honest, we know that actually we've gone astray. We've not followed God's way. We live life our own way. We make the rules. So we've disregarded God in our lives. We've disregarded how he says we should live our lives. In fact, a lot of us have even rejected God's existence. We've even said, no, God doesn't even exist. I'm not even going to give him that. And the Bible says very clearly, it says, that's what our lives are like. And to be honest, those lives that have rejected God, they don't deserve anything good from God. It makes sense, doesn't it? What, what good would they deserve from God? Instead, the Bible says, that, that choosing to live a life against God and rejecting him, that what the Bible calls sin, uh, the, 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 the payment for living that kind of life, the result of living that kind of life is death, and not just a physical death, but an eternal death, eternal separation from God in an awful place called hell. And that's the life without God that I'm saying that you need to, to, to die to. The, 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 the life that is enslaved to sin, that keeps choosing to, to do the wrong things. And Jesus urges you to die to that life. Now, what do I mean by, by that first? What, what do I mean to die to, 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 our, to the life of sin? I, I'm obviously not talking about a literal death. I'm not talking about literally dying. But don't misunderstand me. I also don't mean this. I don't mean, oh, we, we need to realize, oh, our life's not. We're not that great people, actually. We could, we could do a better job. We need to clean, our, clean ourselves up. You know, we need to, to do good, make sure we try better to do good things, uh, maybe to become religious um, and just try our best to be good people and, you know, fix ourselves up. You know, that's not what I mean at all. That's not dying to ourselves. In fact, that's thinking that we can do anything to save ourselves. To die to ourselves is, is to deny ourselves. It's to say that, you know what, my life is like that helpless sheep, that sheep that has made its own mess, that can't save itself, that, that needs somebody to save it. And I'm going to hand my life over. I'm going to give up control of my life and ask God to take control. Ask God to come and change me. Ask God to, to fix my problem of my sin. Ask him to give me that new life, that everlasting life. That's what I mean by to, to, to die to our sins to die to our, to our old life. You might say, why would God even care about me? How, what, you say you've got to give my life over to God to surrender it to him, but why is he even interested? What does he want from me? But we know that God does care. We know that God does care because we, we read it. We see it in the person of Jesus. 
We read those words. Jesus committed no sin. There was no deceit was found in his mouth. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He lived the life we ought to have lived, but we didn't. We, we failed to live. He never did anything wrong, but we go on to read that after a time, he, he was hated. People hurled insults at him. He didn't retaliate. And, and to the point, actually, where they, where they tried him for crimes he didn't commit, and, and they sentenced him to death on a cross, even though he was innocent. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the one who spoke the whole world into existence. He was hung on a cross. They, they drove nails through his hands, through his feet. They, they crushed a, a crown of thorns into his skull. They stripped him almost naked. And they, they hung him to, to die on a cross. And don't, don't think that this was a tragic accident, a, a, a tragic event that was, you know, an unjust event that was never meant to happen. It, it was tragic. It wasn't fair that Jesus died on the cross. But it was the plan of him all along. It was his plan all along to go and to die on that cross. You see, they, they, they actually mocked him when he was on the cross. They said, they said, go on, if you're so powerful, if, if you're the king of kings, you know, you save yourself. And he could have. He totally could have. He spoke the whole world into existence. He spoke and everything came to being. He could have totally saved himself, but he chose not to. He chose to go through with that cruel death. More than that, we read this. We read that he himself bore our sins as he hung on that cross. He chose to have the sins of the world, all this, the wrong things we've done. He chose to have them laid on him. Jesus died the death that we deserve. He, he, he bore hell literally on that cross for us so that we could live, so that we could have that new life, so that we could be changed by him, so that we might know him. You see, the heart of the, the, the message of the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus, is new life. It's a relationship with God. It's life everlasting. It, 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 it's we can face death um, with a certainty of heaven. Death loses its sting, but that's all because of the death of Jesus, because he died for us. And that's what I want to go back to, to where I started this evening as I, as I come to a close. I want to urge you to, to die to your old life, to die to your old life, to give it up, to, to realize that actually we don't deserve anything good from God. Actually, what I'm deserving is God's judgment. I'm deserving of death. Yet I can surrender my life to him. I can hand over control control of my life to God I can ask him to forgive me I can ask him to transform me to give me this new life this eternal life all because of what Jesus has done for me he died in my place on that cross he died to save me and I really want to urge you to consider those things this evening look a, a, a lot of what's been said I've not had long to, to say much um, and a lot of what's been said might have raised more questions do send those questions in um, on the slido but but really, really consider these things because I think it's so important. And I, I want to close this evening just by praying. And I just want to really uh, to just share a little short prayer of commitment, uh, an opportunity for you to surrender your life to God. So you to die to your old self, to, to receive this new life that Jesus wants to give you. Um, and I'm just going to pray simply. I'm just going to ask God that we're sorry. I'm going to say that we're sorry for all that we've done. I'm going to thank him for, for sending Jesus. I'm going to ask him to take control of our life. If, if that's something that you want to do this evening, if you feel like you want to hand your life over to Jesus, to, to, to have this, this new life that, that Melika clearly has, that we can see in her life, then just simply pray along with me in your heart. Um, you don't need to say it out loud. You can if you want. Um, but simply even in your heart, God knows he will hear, he will answer it. And he will give you that new life if you, if you pray this with me. So let me just pray as we close. Father God, um, we just want to say that, that we are sorry for all the sin in my life. I'm sorry for all the times I've gone astray. 
Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross in my place, to take the death that I deserve, to die for all my sins. Lord, we thank you for, for raising Jesus back to life three days later. And Lord, we just pray that you'd forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin and take control of my life. Lord, give me a new life in Jesus. A life with a certainty of the hope of heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Tom. That, that was great. That's really helpful. I can see that you've sent some questions. So we might not get to them all, but I'm going to hand over to Phyllis. And Phyllis is going to, to lead us through with Malika. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Malika, we've got quite a few, and I'm going to try and do them in the order of your testimony. Um, going right back to school days, um, I presume you went to Roman Catholic school. Were the school aware of your home situation, and did they offer you any help and extra support? Um, no, I don't think they were aware. I don't even think I was aware to even want to flag something up. Um, despite despite the dysfunction, you know, bless my mum, she always had me in a clean uniform, you know, and um, we weren't dirty people. So I guess from the outside, um, yeah, there was no like red flags or anything like that. However, I was definitely a trouble troublemaker in class in secondary school. So I'd always be interrupting lessons and wanting the spotlight to be on me, basically. Um, but I don't think any of the teachers kind of thought this, you know. Trying to investigate what the problem was and whether it was issues at home. Yeah, no. Missed an opportunity. And then going back to your testimony, that you mentioned this guy that wouldn't go to church with you. <laughs> How did he come into your life? Was he at university or was he part of this gang that you were with? It just seemed, how did he come into your life? Yes, yeah, so just to clarify, I've, I've never been part of a gang. <laughs> um, I just, the bo a lot of boys that we would have met up with every, you know, every week they were, um, and he was. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it was, I guess, through teenage, so like 13, 14, 15, um, those sort of years. Um, yeah, he just, yeah, I don't even know how I met him. And to be honest with you, I was really surprised when I heard that he was um, a Christian. But bearing in mind, we had had this conversation about Christ now when I'm like 18, 19, we're starting to speak like this. So I think he was also turning his life around. <clears throat> so, but I was really shocked, yeah, to know that he uh, had anything to do with Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's why I, I proudfully wanted to bring him into church, but <laughs> yeah, he schooled me. So. so he came into your life at the right time, really, when yeah, yeah, he to work. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you obviously were converted and you started going to your Bible studies with your friend, um, and you began to learn about this God that you had never known about before, was there one thing that just wowed you, just thought, oh, this is just amazing? Or was it all quite amazing? Was it there was, one thing? Yeah, it was all amazing. But I think like what I'd shared, just the fact that Christ's death was prophesied and that he knew he came to die. He willingly laid it down and that he could prevent at any time it happening but that he, he went through that, he went through the cross um, willingly for his sheep was just like, it was mind blowing. I couldn't believe that sacrifice because like I said in my testimony, I'd always just assumed just from a historical standpoint, oh, the Romans captured him and he wasn't able to like basically keep being like a, you know like how like new age people, think about Jesus he's like a good man and he goes around sharing a message and that's just what I thought about him like he just came to came to share a message I didn't actually know he actually came to give his life mm -hmm. yeah great and just again going back to university did any of your friends at uni ever turn and embrace the new life that you certainly had obviously they thought at one stage that you had died and maybe <laughs> thought you'd go a cult or something but did any of them 
accept what and maybe think that they wanted to come to Bible study with you or church? Um, what I would say is in university regarding my close friends, no, n- not that I know of. Um, not that I know of, no. Um, I did, however, have the blessing of um, being one of one of um, um, one of those people in a girl's life who were sharing Jesus with. It was myself and her sister, I believe, and it was through our witness that she gave her life to Christ, which was really encouraging. Um, but what I will say, which I have to say, because it's just so amazing, um, not from university, but my best friend, who I said that I went to church with. Um, from like 13 we she um yeah she gave her life to Christ so my best friend of all those years um gave her life to Christ um in her later 20s so that was like I really uh, to gain that sister one who was once because she was like family to me you know I was always at her house and she was yeah so to know that she came gave her life to Christ was the biggest gift yeah that's great now, a lot of people have been touched by your talk about um, your your child that you lost, uh, Kezia. And um, what advice would you give to someone who has lost a child in the womb or at a young age? Um, I would say accept the sadness and just just ride it because it's it's natural to feel immense grief and sadness. And, and it's really uncomfortable being in it because you're so vulnerable and there's nothing you can do about it. But that sadness, um, I would just say, just trust the Lord and just ride through it. Um, yeah. Also, there were times when um, I really didn't want to keep living. I, I remember sitting in my car and I wanted to abandon my family. I didn't want to be a mum anymore. I didn't want to be a wife. I literally wanted to drive to her burial place and just lay on the ground and cease to exist. Mm. Um, And I just remember that battle. And I'll just say that, you know, for those in Christ, don't, the Lord is going to do it. Like he's going to keep you. Um, And no matter how much you may want destruction in the face of such in the face of death and pain, the Lord will hold you and he will sustain you, you know, um, and he will do it, you know, like it was the Lord that carried me through. So I would just say like constantly renew your mind on the attributes of God, like who he is, he's wise, he knows, you know, he's all powerful. He could have prevented this you know, like a whole bunch of things. And then also just rejoicing that you've lost a child who has gone to be with Jesus. And for me, like, I'm, I may have four children here, but I might not get to spend eternity with these. Well, my mm. oldest son has professed faith, so mm. God willing. But my other children, I might not be with them for eternity. But I know for sure, even if I miss these years with Kezia on earth, I will get to be with her in the presence of the Lord forever. And yeah. so that's also a gift to me because I don't have to be on my prayer on my knees praying all night oh lord you know save save she's already there so it's weird but it is a gift at the same time yeah Yeah. and so so why similar lines there why do you think many people go through similar circumstances but actually resent what's happened why do I think they would resent it well maybe because they do know God is all powerful and he could have prevented it um maybe there's I don't know maybe there's a level of control yeah you know and also I don't know maybe some people see this life as like a permanent fixture but we're sorry to be morbid but we're all on the conveyor belt <laughs> we're all going one way or the other to the other side of the curtain <laughs> we're all going so it's that renewing of your mind and maybe some people don't meditate enough on the fact that we're all going um but i really don't know 
I, I, I probably don't have enough wisdom to really answer that question, to be fair. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Yeah. And, and don't know other people's circumstances as well. Exactly, so it's yeah. It's quite hard. Yeah. yeah. There's a question here is how did you meet your husband and how has your testimony influenced your friends and have you lost contact with them? Now, you mentioned that yeah. you met your, met your husband at this Bible study. So that we, we heard that earlier on. Yeah. And, and have you got other friends? You've talked about your school friend. So it, it, maybe that question has been answered. That yeah. You have what I will people. say is that my husband said to somebody once, I feel sorry for the guy that's going to marry that girl. <laughs> When I just got saved, I was very loud and um, he just thinking, oh gosh, you know, I wouldn't want a wife like that. <laughs> but as the Lord sanctified me and worked on him. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and was, there any, was there any contact with your brothers? Have you been able to speak with them? I do. That My brothers are in my life. I believe I've shared the gospel with every single one of them, maybe except one or two um just because of distance and opportunity but um none of them have bowed the knee or yeah yeah yeah. one more question and there's one for tom um even as a christian i get angry yet your anger seems to have been dealt with what can you advise me to do about my anger oh wow you know what okay (laughs) whoever sent that out like i have to be completely humble right now and tell you that there are times when I get angry it's nothing like what it used to be but um I still battle with anger um and I think it's a journey like it is definitely I'm definitely growing um I think a lot of the times my anger stems from constant provocation um and I can't handle it very well um or a righteous anger um, over something that is very sinful but um yeah just I mean I'd say we need to just keep praying and we need to keep um every day allowing the spirit to renew us and trusting where God has us now and just realizing look we are sinners mm-hmm. and we're constantly going to be dragging this corpse along you know as we walk this walk but every day you know let's confess it And let's just pray that God will, you know, help us to, you know, go to your elders, go to your pastors, you know, confess it to others. That's another really good thing. So I've got a few other mums who I will, we're really honest with each other and we walk through it together. So when when you're honest with it and you're telling people, also my family as well, I'd tell my husband, you know, I'd confess, um, or even to my children as well, you know, like, so confession is good. (laughs) Keep short accounts and we're in a battle. Tom, yeah. you're still there. Are you still there, Tom? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, the question here is, I keep doing things wrong, even though I handed my life to him, obviously to, to Jesus. Why? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, good question. I guess the first answer to that question is, me too. I keep doing things wrong, even though I've handed my life to Jesus. Um, look, it, it, it's, it's, it's bound to happen. Don't misunderstand what I was saying. When we hand our life to Jesus, we're still the sheep, right? We're still like that sheep that still goes astray at times, that still messes up. It's just that all that wrong stuff that we've done in our life, all the wrong stuff that we're going to do, continue to do in our life, that, that, that has been forgiven. That, that sin has been dealt with by Jesus at the cross. We can be sure of, uh, of eternal life. But also, um, I, I guess Melika's life is a, is a great example as an answer to this um Melika said that overnight there was some instant transformation which is true the bible promises us that that if we hand our life over to jesus if we ask him to to forgive us our sins um the stuff that we've been saying that that actually god sends the holy spirit that is god comes to live within that that person that that new life has has god within them uh, the Holy Spirit, um, and that Holy Spirit will change us. Mm-hmm. It does change us. Um, Melika shared how there was some instant transformation, uh, some instant change in her life. Um, but also she said there were some things that didn't change immediately. I mean, she even just said, uh, confessing then about how she still struggles with this, with anger. Mm. And, and, and 
and and it's and there is that transformation, that gradual transformation as well. Uh, is Melika actually t- mentioned it already? She said that that we are sanctified, and and what that means is we become more and more and more like Jesus. But that takes time. In fact, it takes a lifetime. In fact, even in this lifetime, we're not we're still going to fall short of where we're supposed to be. Um, but God will. We've got that certainty of heaven where one day we will be like Jesus. We will be with him. Um, so d- don't be too discouraged that you mess up because we all mess up. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, like I say. Thank Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Malika. And I'm going to hand back to Steve. Well, that was great. Um, so much to think about, isn't there, what we've, what we've heard. The, the, those questions are great. And thank you to everyone who asked questions. We are back again at eight o'clock, and we have um, um, Piyush Jani, who who grew up as a as a Hindu in Kenya, and came to faith um, after he came to the UK. So do come back for that. Um, and as I said earlier, if if some that's something that's that struck you that you want to get you want to know more about, then do get in touch just through the website, which is www.reallives.net. It's been so good to see you all here. So good that you could join us, and um, that's wonderful. Now we're going to listen to Gus Air. To sing his home by now. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin, a door that is open and you may go in. An old wooden cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. And all that can stop you is your foolish pride Won't you admit that you've cheated and lied But that is the reason the dear Saviour died So come as a sinner to Jesus Won't you come as a sinner to Jesus Peace and forgiveness, a satisfied mind, the sum of the treasures of heaven you'll find. So leave what is hateful and hurtful behind, and come as a sinner to Jesus. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin A door that is open and you may go in At Calvary's cross is where you begin When you come as a sinner to Jesus Won't you come as a sinner to Jesus Please come as a sinner to Jesus.